Call to order the Commerce uh, Committee. We do have a quorum. Our first item is approval of our minutes from the last meeting. Representative Katiza Watoon. Uh, Mr. Chair, I would move approval of the March 20th minutes. Okay. Representative Katiza Watoon moves approval of our minutes from March 20th, 2023. Any discussion to the motion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion prevails. Minutes are adopted. Uh, the next item on our agenda is House File 2300, which is uh, my bill, but I'm we heard this bill last week, so I'm just going to remain in the, the chair to briefly dispose of it because we're not going to take any testimony or and we don't have any amendments. Um, we're just moving this bill uh, out of committee uh, as a potential vehicle and to also help allow it to make deadline. Um, but we had the discussion uh, last week. Uh, so I will move House File 2300 be recommended to be referred to the committee on ways and means. Discussion to the motion. Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. House File 2300 is recommended to be re-referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. Uh, we will next, I'm just wondering if, is Representative Lee here? Yes, okay, so we will next move to House File 2823 from Representative Lee. Welcome to the committee, Representative Lee. While you are making your way down, I will move House File 2823 be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. And uh, Representative Lee, you have the A1 amendment, which is, I assume, an author's amendment to get the bill in the shape you'd like the committee to consider it. Is that correct? That's right, Mr. Chair. All right, so I will move the A1 amendment, discussion to the amendment. Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. A1 is adopted. Representative Lee, to your bill. Great. Thank you, Chair, members, uh, for hearing House File 2823 today. This is a simple bill that would bring Minnesota's consumer protections up to the standards of almost all the other states in our union by adding unfairness to our consumer fraud statute. That's right, 45 other states in the District of Columbia all protect their citizens from unfair acts or practices. My witness today, the Assistant Attorney General will go more into detail, but simply put, unfairness is so commonly part of consumer fraud protections that the short name for these statutes is UDAP laws, unfair, deceptive acts or practices. However, Minnesota is an anomaly without unfairness as part of our protections because we adopted our consumer protection law in its early form. To fix, the, to fix this, I am respectfully requesting possible inclusion of House File 2823, and with that, I will turn it to my witness today. Thank you, Representative Lee, and we do have uh, Jason Blagenkuhl. Mr. Blagenkuhl. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, good afternoon. My name is Jason Plegenkuhl. I am an Assistant Attorney General and Manager of the Consumer Wage and Antitrust Division of the Attorney General's Office. Attorney General Ellison regrets that he can't be here with you today, but asked me to testify in his stead to voice his strong support for House File 2823, which updates Minnesota's core consumer protection laws to prohibit unfair or unconscionable acts or practices. Minnesota is one of only six states in the entire country whose consumer protection laws do not contain any unfair acts or practices prohibition. This prohibition is commonplace throughout the country, both at the state and federal level. 45 states in the District of Columbia, ranging in political makeup from California to Texas and West Virginia, all protect their consumers from unfair or unconscionable acts or practices. But presently, Minnesota law does not. This legislation would fix that and bring Minnesota law into conformity with the vast majority of other states that protect their consumers from unfair practices. House File 2823 would add an important tool to the Attorney General's consumer protection tool belt that other states and the federal government already possess. It would result in the Attorney General's office being able to protect consumers from conduct that is unfair and harmful, but not necessarily deceptive. For example, an unfair acts or practices prohibition would allow the office to better police unfair provisions in consumer adhesion contracts, coercive high sales high sale pressure uh, tactics and collection tactics, unconscionable or discriminatory pricing practices, uninhabitable living conditions in leased residences and coercive lease provisions, and abusive debt collection practices. House File 2823 also codifies the standard used by most other states when determining what acts or practices are unfair or unconscionable. Specifically, an act or practice is unfair or unconscionable when it offends public policy as it's been established by statutes, rules, or common law in Minnesota, is immoral, unethical, oppressive, or unscrupulous, or is substantially injurious to consumers. 
This standard originated with the FTC. It's been approving, approvingly acknowledged by the United States Supreme Court and is the standard most commonly used by other states that have unfairness prohibitions. These states have developed a substantial body of case law pursuant to this standard, which will be helpful to Minnesota courts when applying the same standard here. Prohibiting consumers from being victimized by unfair, <laughs> unkind, unconscionable acts and practices will help them afford their lives and live with dignity and respect. It would also make Minnesota's consumer protection laws consistent with nearly every other state in the country. And for these reasons, Attorney General Ellison urges the committee to support passage of House File 2823. Thank you. Thank you for being here and uh, appreciate uh, the, your office's work on this. I know the Attorney General raised this issue at our very first meeting uh, this year. I remember in his uh, testimony for this committee, him urging us to take action on this issue. So we regret it's taken us this long to get to it, but I appreciate uh, you being here today. Uh, there are several members of the public who have signed up to testify. We have first Beth Cadoon, Ms. Cadoon. And uh, we're asking all testifiers to keep their testimony to two minutes today. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Beth Cadoon. I represent the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce, an organization of 6,300 businesses of all sizes and industries across the state of Minnesota. We do oppose this bill as this bill does not provide clear guidance to businesses to seeking to comply with the law. The bill contains many vague and undefined terms, so businesses will be left in a state of unpredictability on what is and is not a legitimate business practice. The bill language contains terms such as unscrupulous, immoral, and substantially injurious that not only creates a great deal of uncertainty for businesses, but also greatly enhance litigation risk as these vague terms are combined with private rights of actions and the ability to collect attorney fees. Current lawful com competition and business practices benefiting consumers may now result in a lawsuit. The bill gives business competitors substantial power to sue, sue over nearly all business activity that they individually consider as harmful. The bill gives standing uh, for businesses to sue for competition based on harm to their business rather than under the well-established standard um, sorry, antitrust standard. Get back, sorry. Thank you. Sorry. I am, um, hope this is not away from my time here. No, we'll give you a little. Okay. Um, well established standard of law um, that allows for the protection of the consumer, not the um, competitor. This is also a highly complicated litigated area of the law with extensive federal law and extensive case law. This bill is also changing language that was part of a model act on the Uniform Deceptive Trade Practice Act from the Uniform Law Commission. Um, we would uh, recommend looking at the utilizing that, that model under the Uniform Law Commission as certainly an avenue to consider in making modification as that will ensure these changes are well vetted, taking into account the impacts on consumer businesses and our state's business climate and making sure the language is well understood. We would urge your opposition to this bill as it does not create workable laws allowing businesses to know what and it was not, what is not lawful conduct. We are happy to work with the legislators and the Attorney General's office to make sure language changes will prevent uncompetitive behavior and fraud, but will also not undermine our competitive free market system that allows for our economy to grow, evolve, and innovate. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Bruce Newstead. Mr. Newstead. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Bruce Newstead. I'm with the Minnesota Retailers Association. I work with uh, large national brands, regional retailers, and uh, Main Street family-owned retailers as well. I want to thank you for the opportunity to uh, testify today. I had a great opportunity to have a conversation with Reverend Lee on, on her bill briefly and look forward to talking more about it as we sort of seek to understand the goals of the language. Um, my main concern today is, uh, Mr. Chair, actually it's a compliment to you. You passed a piece of legislation relating to price gouging this year, which uh, did a really nice job defining terms. And as uh, Ms. Cadoon pointed out, when you look at some of the terms in uh, Reverend Lee's bill, uh, they, are, they feel a little vague and nebulous. Uh, so as we look to, to 
to touch Minnesota's consumer fraud statute or deceptive trade practices. It's really important that we do a little bit deeper job relative to defining terms and what they mean. And that's actually a, a great thing for consumers. It's a great thing for retailers. It's a great uh, thing for regulars as well, as when everybody sort of understands the terms and what they need. Uh, it leads everybody to a set of expectations. So I don't want to say today that I'm not for combating consumer fraud or combating deceptive trade practices. That's certainly not the case. We just want to make sure that is done in a fair and equitable way that makes sense to all. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And uh, last, we have Jennifer Brettinger. Ms. Brettinger. Good afternoon, Chair Stevenson and committee members. Uh, my name is Jennifer Breidinger. I'm the lobbyist for MinFloor. It's Minnesotans for Lawsuit Reform. Our group represents a broad coalition of small and large businesses and other entities. Um, your committee passed a bill just a couple days ago in the same area, and I think it was a, a, a good process. We worked closely with legal aid, the proponents um, about that bill, and again, it was in the same general area, 325, which is the private attorney general statute. Um, our chief concern, is over words that appear on lines 3.6, immoral, unethical, oppressive, and unscrupulous. We all know that we've heard the phrase, I know it when I see it. These were said in 1964 by a conservative jurist, Potter Stewart, and it was about pornography. This phrase is viewed somewhat as a relic of the past. In layman's terms and in jurisprudence, an attempt to take something subjective and make it categorical in his opinion, as it were. The language before you appears to be based on a Federal Trade Commission <laughs> policy statement, not a case, not a ruling, not case law, not federal law, not state law. Words like immoral only appear sparsely in Minnesota statute. With regard to license plates, it can't be immoral. I don't know who makes that determination, but everybody's got to look at your license plate. Immoral also appears in teacher licensing statutes. You may not date students. I think we can all agree on some things, but we would like more time to work on this bill because otherwise restaurant A could go after restaurant B for competitive behavior simply because one restaurant determines the other restaurant doesn't get its meat products in an ethical manner. Clinic A could go after clinic B who they compete directly with because one clinic provides certain services to women that the first clinic determines are immoral or unethical. I, I think we may be opening up a can of worms. We stand ready to work with the author, who was kind enough to call me last night because our meeting couldn't happen quickly enough. But we would like more definition in this area of the statute. We believe we can help create a, a better bill, perhaps, if this has additional stops. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. All right, uh, that concludes public testimony. Discussion to the bill. <coughs> Representative Dotson. Thank you, uh, fellow chair. I, I, I've got a question for the first, uh, uh, the representative from the um, uh, Attorney General's office, please. And he's coming down. Thank you. you can go ahead and state your question. <coughs> question I've got that you had mentioned the conversation about offends public policy. Can you explain that a little bit more detail, what that actually looks like, or give me more clarity on that? Mr. Blake and Cool. Mr. Thank Chair, you. Representative, happy to. Um, offending public policy, like I said, this is a standard that's been adopted by most states that have an unfairness prohibition in their consumer protection laws. And that phrase has been interpreted by courts in numerous states to mean that the violation comes within the meaning of some statute, rule, or clearly articulated public policy of the state that um, has established a concept of unfairness. And um, just to give you an example, uh, North Carolina, for example, um, brought an unfairness claim against a company that attempted to disguise high interest payday loans as a service contract. And the, the courts looked at all the facts and circumstances of that case and said, the state of North Carolina has a clearly articulated public policy against usury, which is charging excessive interest rates. And so this practice of attempting to disguise a loan with excessive interest rates is unfair because it's, it would be usurious. And so that's the type of conduct that that standard would enca encapsulate. Do you yeah, th thank you, Chair. Uh, do you see where this could be potentially be abused and maybe uh, determined independently by the attorneys general where it can be uh, interpreted differently than uh, other states and other uh, communities as well? Does that make sense? Mr. Plagenkuhl? Mr. Chair, Representative, I think that's highly unlikely just because there's 
there's so much case law. There's treatises on UDAP laws, which include unfairness prohibitions. There's a lot of case law, and there's very clear case law that, that indicates um, these standards do not encapsulate uh, everyday business disputes. There has to be something more than that that makes them unfair, shocks the conscious, unconscionable. And, and so <laughs> it, it's been decided through a number of decisions through many courts, both at the federal and state level, um, that will help guide Minnesota courts um, when they make these determinations. Thank you. Representative Johnson. Okay. Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And my questions are for Representative Lee. I'm wondering, Representative Lee, if you can, if you can walk us through, um, if you can walk us through some of this language. Clearly, we're all looking at the same thing. Many of our testifiers had the same concerns that I did in the copy of the bill that I marked up. Um, so my concern, as I think is shared by a lot of people, is that this is going to be litigated, that this, that this is not going to stand without being challenged. And so I think it is really important that we understand your legislative intent, your intent with this language. And so I would just ask particularly um, on, on number two there, is immoral, unethical, oppressive, or unscrupulous? How would you define those those words? What is your intent with that language in this bill? And Representative Lee, or if you could direct that question to Mr. Plagg and Cool, you're welcome to do that as well. But Representative Lee. Sure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I can do a quick overview, and then um, I will give the rest of my time to my testifier. Um, I mean, like we said at the beginning, um, the intent of this legislation is to ensure that we protect Minnesota consumers. And we've seen um, in the past two years that, uh, you know, we, we need more consumer protections, right? And I think um, Mr. Plegenkul gave a really good example of um, uh, payday lenders trying to disguise what they're trying to do, which is really robbing people of um, their hard-earned dollars. And so that is the intent. Um, I'm going to defer to uh, my witness to go into more um, the case law that has actually established um, what these terms mean. Mr. Plegenkul. Cool. Mr. Chair, Representative, um, happy to try to do so in a, a nutshell. Um, so uh, immoral, unethical, oppressive, or unscrupulous is one of three prongs. And so um, there are cases um, finding unfair practices um, under that second prong. Uh, just to give you some examples, uh, for example, unethical. Um, there was a Connecticut case that held uh, a contractor was engaging in a form of bid rigging. And the, uh, there was a uh, construction industry association that had issued a policy statement saying that for our industry, that is an unethical practice. The, uh, the attorney general uncovered conduct that constituted that bid rigging practice and alleged that was an unfair practices, practice as being unethical under that second prong that the court upheld based on uh, the policy determination of the industry. So that would be an e example of unethical. Um, oppressive means to be, to in inflict unjust hardship or constraint on a consumer. And uh, an example there, an Illinois case, there was a a uh, car company that wrongfully repossessed a consumer's car. And rather than return the vehicle and have them return their balance to, uh, to fully paid, instead the company said, I'm gonna keep your car unless you pay the full balance to me now, which was $40,000. The court there found that practice to be oppressive uh, as being inflicting unjust infliction of hardship on that consumer. And so these are the type of practices that states across the country um, have the tools to um, enforce as attorney generals. And, and that's what Minnesota would like to be able to do here for consumers in the state. Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So we didn't actually get any definitions there from either uh, the representative or the testifier. Um, and so let me ask it this way, Representative Lee, um, who will have the discretion to determine what is immoral, unethical, or oppressive, or unscrupulous? I'll uh, turn the question to Representative Lee, but I, I don't know that I agree with the assertion we haven't heard definitions. I think we've been hearing uh, We heard uh, examples, but not Hold definitions. On a Excuse me. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, <laughs> if you would wish to, wish to be recognized, I can do that in a minute. But don't talk over me, please. Uh, we heard examples, and we also heard references to the fact that this has been adopted in many other states, that there's voluminous case law, that there are treatises 
about this and that we are trying to take the same approach as other states. So there's been a lot to that point. Um, did you want to respond to that, Representative Brindley? I do, Mr. Chair, because you, uh, you misrepresented what I said. What I said is we have not heard a definition, and even in what you said, we still have not heard a definition. We've heard lots of other words around this language. We've not heard a definition for any of these words. That's what I'm asking. And since we're not getting a definition, I am asking then who does get to decide what these words mean? Thank you, Representative Newbrindley. I understand you're not satisfied with the answers, but I don't think that you're characterizing <laughs> their answers correctly. Uh, Representative Lee, I think the question was about who decides. Representative Lee? That's right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So. Um, I, I just want to respond a little bit that the definitions are, are in case law, right? And so um, I, I, yeah. I, I can start with the overview and uh, defer to, to my witness um, that this, this, if, if this House file um, is included um, and, and is passed, um, the Attorney General would be empowered to protect consumers. And so um, he would make that discretion. But um, I, I will allow my witness to, to expound on that. Mr. Plagan, cool. Mr. Chair, Representative, um, that's right. The, the attorney general would, would look for act, uh, patterns and practices of conduct that affect uh, large portions of consumers. But the ultimate arbiter about whether the standard is established is gonna be the court. Uh, we'll make the best argument we can to the court based on the facts available, <coughs> but the court's the one that will ultimately decide is it an unfair act or practice based on all the facts and circumstances presented in evidence. Representative Newbrunley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would just add, we still have not heard a definition. Um, this will be heard in the courts, and, and therefore, the folks we're talking about, our businesses, are going to have to deal with this. They're going to have to deal with this legislation and the consequences of it at great cost, because, of course, as we know, the legislature gives lots of money to the Attorney General's office, uh, but... Um, Businesses are going to have to absorb the costs of this. And some of those businesses, I get it, big businesses, they can absorb those legal costs, but there are plenty of businesses who are small and don't have legal teams at their disposal and will have to put great expense into this without any idea of what might be coming. The problem with this is that we're, we're, we're hearing lots of examples, we're told that it's in case law, but if we can't even, in, in, in this body right now, define these words and tell our business community, hey, this is the standard. This is what this is going to mean for you. Surely, surely you can understand why that would be concerning to those folks who are going to have to live up to this standard that is incredibly unclear. This is simply not ready for prime time. I can't believe anyone would vote for this. Representative Niska. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and Representative Lee, um, a lot of the examples your testifier gave are examples that we as a legislature either have law, have passed law about or could um, already, uh, or, or could do, uh, you know, pass provisions about adhesion contracts, uh, adhesion provisions and consumer contracts, price discrimination, debt collection, uh, payday lenders. So my question is, why would we want to delegate our uh, policymaking in that area to the Attorney General's office or to the courts? Representative Lee. Uh, so Mr. Niska, I have not specifically reviewed each of these cases, um, but the, the goal is actually um, to ensure that we are strengthening consumer protection. So I, I, I disagree that um, you know, we would be, um, you know, uh, I guess, I, I think your, your assertion is that if we pass this bill that the legislature is, um, deferring its power to the Attorney General's office, and I, and I, I, I disagree. Representative Niska. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and Representative Lee. I, I think it's pretty clear from the way that Mr. Plegenkuhl has described the Attorney General's discretion and, and ability to bring cases in this area um, and, and the examples he gave that we would be uh, really delegating a lot of power. But I, I, I also wanted to turn to a... a an issue that I think has been left out in the description here, which is that um, by adding um, this language into 325D.44, we're creating a private right of action for competitors, for any other person, for consumers to bring uh, private rights of action. And so, um, uh, Representative Lee or, or Mr. Plegenkuhl, I'm curious as to what, um, what a, a district court judge would look to if, for example, um, a uh, 
competitor sued uh, the, the uh, a, a restaurant sued the restaurant across the street and said that um, because they had raised the wages of workers at that restaurant and, and were hiring away all of uh, their workers, um, that that was a, a, a method of competition act or practice that's substantially injurious to competitors. If a, if a restaurant brought a, a, a suit against the restaurant across the street on that grounds, what, what would a district court judge look to to determine whether or not that uh, constituted a deceptive trade practice that they could get an injunction attorney's fees for under 325D.45. That sounded to me like a, a question for Mr. Plegenkuhl about Representative Lee, if you wanted to. Rep Mr. Plegenkuhl. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative. Um, so uh, the, I think the, the court would will obviously look at all the facts and evidence introduced by, by both parties. Uh, but there is clear case law that this is not intended to bring in uh, private business, dis like everyday private business disputes into the realm of the unfairness standard. So there's pretty clear case law that establishes that. So the, the court would be looking for conduct that shocks the conscious or is a, a clear, like clearly unfair under the facts and circumstances. So they'd be looking for um, something beyond just normal competition. Um, and whether I think it would take into account potential anti-competitive conduct under the Antitrust Act as well. Representative Niska. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Plegenkuhl. Um, that uh, Mr. Plegenkuhl. Mr. Plegenkuhl. You said Representative. <laughs> I, I did that to a different way. Uh, I, you know, it was uh, Commissioner Lucero. I did that to. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. I apologize for the uh, demotion, Mr. Plegenkuhl. Um, uh, My, my question is, where is that language in the statute? So specifically in uh, subclause three of the definition of unfair uh, or unconscionable practices, it says in a, in, a, in a disjunctive phrase, is substantially injurious to consumers, competitors, or other business persons. That you use the word shocks the conscience several times. We're not writing that into the statute. So. Um, is it the word substantial that uh, in incorporates into it some uh, antitrust violation or some uh, shocks the conscious standard? Um, where, where does the district court judge look to um, in interpreting the words in this statute in order to uh, get something more than just substantially injurious, which is a, a very, very broad and, and not particularly high standard um, uh, I, I have a whole bunch of other examples we could talk about. An attorney general who thinks that, uh, maybe the next attorney general thinks uh, House File 100 uh, is wrong and that cannabis sales are substantially injurious uh, to consumers and, and goes to enjoin all cannabis um, in a world in which House File 100 has passed, uh, it sues to enjoin all cannabis uh, sellers on the ground that it's substantially injurious to consumers. What does a district court judge look to in interpreting these words of this bill um, in order to determine uh, whether that suit should prevail or not? Mr. Blankenkohl. Mr. Chair, Representative, substantially injurious and, and the third prong of the test um, has been uh, decided in, in numerous cases. So courts would look to numerous cases in other states and at the federal level who, who have that standard. Um, the FTC, for example, uh, has a similar standard, and there they would look to balancing both pro-competitive effects and, and the injury to, to determine is there substantial injury under the fa all the facts and circumstances of the case. So there's that, this standard has been borne out and um, applied in numerous cases that provide guidance to courts, and that's, that's why the standard was chosen, because this is the standard most states use. Representative Niska. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and, and uh, Mr. Plegenkuhl. Um, I, I, I want to, uh, first of all, I, I'm interested to, to know whether there is a particular case you can point Minnesota, Minnesota judges to to help them um, understand the, the author's intent of this uh, language, since, again, we're, I, I guess, incorporating some other case law from some other jurisdictions into the standard. But um, I. I also want to just make totally clear for the record, because again, this isn't in the, in the language. Uh, um, 
is it your assertion, I think I heard you say, that uh, there is going to be, there would have to be a balancing of pro-competitive and anti-competitive effects, not simply um, the injury to a particular competitor or something like that, which is what the language would seem to imply. Mr. Plunkett, cool. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative, that, that's the standard as the FTC has articulated it, so that is one possibility courts could look to. Uh, but it would, it would, it really does depend under the facts and circumstances of each case whether that would even be necessary. Some conduct is so patently injurious that there, there is, there would be no pro-competitive effect you could point to. So it, it depends on. Uh, I'm sorry to give you the an attorney's answer, but it depends on the facts and circumstances of, of the particular case. I think Representative Niska probably appreciates an attorney's yeah. answer. <laughs> Representative Niska, if you have one final follow-up, I'll give it to you, and then we have two other members on the list. Uh, no, Mr. Chair, thank you. I, I um, again, the it depends is the problem with this with this bill. We're talking about a bunch of specific areas in which we, as the legislature, either have legislated, or would like to legislate, or might legislate in the future. And to just uh, throw an it depends on the facts and circumstances of a case brought by the attorney general or brought by another competitor or brought by other business persons or anyone who um, uh, thinks that they are being harmed under 325D.44 um, and then putting it in the hands of, uh, of the courts to decide whether something offends public policy and not necessarily violates a, a provision but offends public policy or is immoral, eth unethical, oppressive, or unscrupulous or is substantially injurious to consumers, competitors, or other business persons. That is a abrogation, a delegation of our power as the legislature to the attorney general's office, to private litigants, and to the judiciary that I think is very unwise. Representative Grant. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and uh, I for, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Mr. Plagenkuhl. Mr. Plagenkuhl. Tough one to, to curl off the tongue. Um, so, can you remind me how many states already have this kind of a thing in place? Mr. Plagenkuhl. Mr. Chair, Representative, 45 states and the District of Columbia already contain an unfairness prohibition in their consumer protection laws. And also the FTC Act, the Consumer Financial Protection Act, and the, the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act under federal law all contain similar unfairness prohibitions. Representative Kraft. And, uh, one, one more follow up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I imagine business is still happening in these places. The courts have set kind of clear standards and, and the, the sky has not fallen. Mr. Plug and cool. Mr. Chair, Representative, that's right. These, these prohibitions in many states and at the federal level have been in place for decades. And Minnesota is really behind the curve when it comes to what provisions most states have to protect consumers. And that's the intent of the bill. Thank you. Representative Bierman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, thank you, Representative Lee, for bringing this bill forward. I've learned a lot listening to everybody today. I can't speak for all business, but I can speak for my small business. And I'll tell you, as I read over this bill before coming down here, I, I didn't expect any controversy on this. I think the words that are used and put into these this bill, they're pretty clear if you apply some human logic about being fair to your customers, you know, be fair, be just, or utilize what I do in my business, the rotary four-way test, which my great-grandfather started in our business, and that's kind of the process we, we run our business by. We've never been in court over these words or any other words. So I think this is an easy bill for me to vote yes on, and I appreciate you bringing it forward. Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm going to jump right to the Attorney General's office for my questions, if, if you don't mind. Um, so we have heard um, over the last couple of years some legislation through this committee that um, for various reasons has not become law. And one of those is um, what we call the right to repair. And basically what that does is it says that if you have a contract with a, um, I'll just use a, you know, a, a cell phone um manufacturer that that cell phone manufacturer wants to have that serviced at one of their approved retailers or one of their approved um, service centers. 
We've heard people come in here who have said that it's inconvenient, that they think it's uh, oppressive to them. They also believe that it's not competitive and it puts them at a disadvantage as the consumer that they can't have one of those repair shops within a reasonable distance of their home, but they do have another that would be able to provide those services. And the genesis behind the bill is that those who don't have a contract would be able, uh, required to, or should say be allowed to, and the manufacturer would have to allow those individual businesses access to those phones to be able to do that. Would that be considered under this bill to be immoral, unethical, oppressive, etc.? And then thus the Attorney General's office would take action against a company that made and entered into contracts with providers? Mr. Plagan, cool. Mr. Chair, Representative, I'm not aware of uh, an unfairness prohibition like this being used uh, to bring a right to repair case uh, across the country. And that's why there's been initiatives throughout the states to seek legislation to that effect. Representative Driscoll. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'd like to go back to something else that Representative Brinley said. And I think that we have to, un or excuse me, I think it might have been um, um, Representative Niska when he talked about um, the fact that the legislature is considering a marijuana bill moving that forward. It is still illegal under the federal law, and states have been. Um, passing laws to uh, legalize the use and distribution of that in various different levels. But what about the fact that an attorney general at the uh, federal level who may say, you know what, we're going to actually enforce federal law, would that be considered to be something that would be immoral, unethical, and oppressive, and we would just go to court and say, yep, we're just going to go ahead and continue that practice in Minnesota, even though it's a violation of the federal law? Does that fall into this category in any way? Mr. Plugging, cool. Mr. Chair, Representative, no, and I'm not aware of any states using uh, unfairness provisions to try to import federal law. Um, so I don't think that's the intent of this, and that's why, for example, prong one uh, provided discusses the public policy as established in Minnesota, not as established by the federal government. Well, Mr. Chair, my final comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My final comments um, is I'm disappointed that we spent about 30 minutes asking for definitions and examples, and all we've got is, well, other states are doing it, the sky isn't falling there. Our Minnesota businesses, who are going through an awful lot right now, are asking for some guardrails, some explanations, some understanding about how the, the rules would change in the state of Minnesota and how they would end up having to do business or change their business practices under, under this um, bill. Obviously, no one wants to have people who truly are involved in unethical, unscrupulous, et cetera. But unfortunately, the uh, business community is not getting a definition on this today, nor is this committee. And so it is my hope that members would vote no. And um, if this does get challenged, this has been a great exercise in legislative intent where we have words, no definitions, and a bunch of platitudes. And the courts will have some fun with that, and, uh, and attorneys will as well. So with that, Mr. Chair, I encourage a no vote on this bill today. And I'd also like a roll call. There's no, uh, the motion is to lay over. There's not well, going to be a vote. So uh, today we'll, we'll catch we'll catch that another time. I'm sure you will. Uh, of course you before will. we turn it over to um, uh, Representative Flutie for final comments, I will just note that I I think that there has been a lot of clarity provided by the Attorney General's office. What's incredible to me is that after hearing that this bill has been in effect for decades in 45 other states, that treatises have been written about it, this bill, the idea that this is not a well understood or well defined principle to me is incredible. Like, it obviously is. Uh, it obviously is well understood. And it obviously is well understood all across the country. It's just a protection that our consumers in Minnesota don't have and should have. So thank you, Representative Lee, for bringing a bill. And thank you to the Attorney General for bringing forth an idea to have Minnesota catch up to where the vast majority of states, red and blue, are already at. Representative Lee, closing comments. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee for the robust discussion. Um, I mean, simply put, making unfair practices violations under the, our consumer fraud statute would also, you know, protect consumers and legitimate businesses. I understand our small businesses have, um, you know, suffered in the last two years, um, but, you know, we, we want to make sure that we support our legitimate businesses. So I appreciate the discussion and want to make sure that Minnesota uh, joins the other 45 states in the District of Columbia and our union to, um, you know, address bad actors um, when we need to. So I uh, appreciate you considering uh, including House File 2823 in um, your bills.
Thank you, uh, Representative Lee. And with that, the bill is laid over. Uh, the next item on the agenda is House File 2100 from Representative Jordan. Welcome to the committee, Representative uh, Jordan. I will move House File 2100 be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. Representative Jordan, to your bill. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Stevenson and members. I'm happy to be here today with House File 2100, which would create a grant program through the Department of Commerce to be used for air ventilation repairs, upgrades, and full replacements in schools. And members, before I get going, I want to note that this is a work in progress. Um, we are still working on final language with the bill with um, workers and advocates um, and the departments. But this grant program is important. Uh, air quality in our schools matters. Prior to COVID, uh, the number one reason why children in Minneapolis public schools missed school was because of asthma. Um, asthma is a respiratory disease, so is COVID. Not only that, um, our air quality for both heating and air is important for student learning and student um, achievement. And during COVID, we saw these disparities amongst our schools in terms of who had the resources to keep students and staff safe with, high, with better indoor air quality. And that's why this bill focuses first on the schools that are most in need. If schools do not have full-time professionals on site, it's likely that they have not been conducting regular assessments of their full ventilation systems. Um, and this grant program is intended to get them access to that, help perform the work, and make sure our schools are safer for students and staffs, but are also have energy efficiency, which will help us with climate goals and save schools money on utility bills. Um, while conducting these assessments, many deficiencies will be found that allow for schools to proactively address many of their heating and cooling needs, especially cooling. Those hot months during a school year can be extremely difficult for everyone inside these facilities, and you're going to hear from an educator. Um, you're going to hear from an educator shortly who will tell you just how difficult it is to teach and learn when it is extremely hot out. And members, this does matter for student achievement. Um, I think you will remember um, that the St. Paul Public Schools had to cancel a week of school and end the school year early a few years ago because of extreme heat, because so many of their facilities did not have the HVAC systems that were needed to keep classrooms clean and keep students and staff safe. Um, we also, it's important that this work is being done by a skilled and trained workforce. During COVID, we did see many emerging sales techniques pop up and make a lot of promises about what air, indoor air quality could be without the data to back it up. And so by requiring this work to be done by a skilled and trained workforce, we can ensure that the state resources and school resources are being spent in responsible ways by a workforce dedicated to quality uh, control. There are a lot of stakeholders that um, are, are working on this. As I mentioned, it is supported by a broad coalition. Uh, one of the changes that I, I think I will be pursuing is some of the um, questions around uh, the certification uh, that is outlined in the bill. I think that is pretty easily um, adjusted to make sure that all workers um, who are skilled and able to do this work can be employed in doing this work. Um, and with that, Chair Stevenson, I would like to turn over the bill presentation to Colin Beery with the Sheet Metal Workers Local 10. Mr. Beery, welcome to the committee. And state your name for the record, proceed to your testimony. Chair and members, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Chair, if it uh, makes sense, I would like to just brief on our support side and then do a high level on, on the bill walkthrough. That sounds, sounds great. Okay, I'll carry through with that. My name is Colin Beery. I am, uh, run government affairs for the Sheet Metal Workers Local 10. I'm here to speak in support of House File 2100. Our members uh, work predominantly in the vertical construction industry, fabricating, installing, upgrading, and maintaining HVAC systems. We see the creation of this air ventilation program as a step forward in addressing and improving the artificial environments our members have helped create for decades inside of school facilities. We ask the, com the committee to support House File 2100 and thank Chair Stevenson for allowing the bill to be heard and many thanks to the author for carrying this bill. Uh, moving on to the bill itself. So, uh, walking through the bill, obviously the outline of the program itself, the air ventilation program, then moving on to section two, we get into grant, uh, program grants and guidelines. Uh, inside of that, we talk, uh, it, it outlines grant awarded, uh, grants awarded for reimbursement for things such as a physical ve ventilation assessment, work performed, possible fixes, additions and upgrades to the ventilation system. Moving on to grant awards, uh, outlines 
work performed by quality, uh, qualified testing personnel, work performed by skilled trained uh, workforce, reimbursements to schools after HVAC verification report, outlines compliance with listed requirements on assessed systems, prioritizes support to Title I funded schools, grants reimburse 50% costs incurred to the school, then moving on to guidelines and rules, uh, adoption of the program guidelines, establish timing of the grant funding, technical reporting ability to amend, fund uh, funds for the to be to the administrator for the program. And then moving on to section three, we have all the definitions. Section four, appropriations. Uh, thank you for your time. I stand for questioning. Thank you, Mr. Beery. Uh, we have a few other uh, testifiers that we'll take now, and then we'll move to uh, discussion and questions. Uh, the first on my list is John Quarnstrom. Come forward, state your name for the record, proceed your testimony. And again, the two minute uh, uh, thing is in, in apply here too. Thank you, Mr. Chair, honorable members of the committee. My name is John Kornstrom. I am the CEO of the Sheet Metal Air Conditioning and Roofing Contractors Association. We're a local trade association with 200 plus contractors performing HVAC work in Minnesota. We support House File 2100 because of the importance of indoor air quality in schools. Over the last couple of years, the importance of maximizing the number of air exchanges, maximizing air filtration, and ensuring ventilation systems are, are uh, operating as designed, that importance has been elevated. When the HVAC system is working properly, there is reduced exposure to airborne illnesses, including COVID. Good ventilation reduces CO2 levels, which improves the learning opportunities in school. And finally, an HVAC, HVAC system operating as designed is more energy efficient than compared to being out of sync. It appears state dollars will soon be available for determining whether these HVAC systems are operating properly and whether these systems are, uh, are achieving all of the air exchanges that they can if they're properly dialed in. House File 2100 ensures that indoor air quality assessments will be performed by quality qualified personnel that are knowledgeable on HVAC design and operation. House File 2100 ensures that the needed repairs and revisions will be performed by quality personnel. To simplify, we support House File 2100 because using qualified per personnel to perform indoor air quality work provides the best opportunity for return on state investment dollars in schools. Thank you, sir. Thank uh, you. Our next testifier is Ken McCrawley. Come forward, state your name for the record, proceed your testimony. Welcome to the committee. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair and the members of the, the committee. Um, I think this is a great bill, um, but what I think it leaves out is all the minority contractors um, that um, aren't a part of uh, um, of a trade association, um, you know, being a, a union, or or having uh, an apprenticeship, pro, an approved apprenticeship program, right? There are good companies out there that uh, actually um, go have training programs, right? It immediately um, puts my 38 um, black men um, out of work. The, we, we can't, um, you know, since we're not an approved apprenticeship program, we can't work in the schools, right? So this bill says that um, we're looking for the schools that, uh, that are poverty ridden and to be able to upgrade their HVAC program. 100% agree with that. There needs to be a program like that. But I want, I want the people who work for me that live in North Minneapolis, South Minneapolis, and in, in the St. Paul area to be able to participate in this program. 
maybe it's a change of language, right? Um, it immediately puts a hardship on minority companies. Um, minority companies that um, right now are not participating for, for numerous reasons, right? But the ones that are, it, it immediately puts a hardship on them. There needs, the, the state has a, a diverse business um, enterprise program that the state pays millions of dollars for people um, in the state um, to put out there. We need to put those, uh, we need to put those businesses to work to be able included in this bill. I don't know what that language looks like, but they need to be able to participate, right? I agree that they need to have training, they need to be skilled, um, but it has to be more than one track. So there, if this bill goes through, there's a lot of people of color that will not work or participate in that. I guess the question is, is how many companies or how many black companies are there that are currently participating and how many will it leave behind? I think the bill needs, the language needs to be changed to include those companies. Thank you. Thank you. Our next testifier is David Raji. Please come forward, state your name for the record, proceed your testimony. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair. David Raji, and Raji is spelled R-A-D-Z-I-E-J. I'm the Executive Vice President of the Plumbing, Heating, and Cooling Contractors uh, here in Minnesota. Our offices are in Arden Hills, and we are one of the longest continuous managed nonprofit construction associations, associations in the state. We date back to 1883, some 30 years after the state of Minnesota was formed. Every improvement in your life is a result of a change you have made, but not every change is an improvement. House file 2100 is, it starts off on the right foot. It appropriates grant money for school boards to make needed assessments and improvements to the air quality inside our schools. As studies have proven that better air quality has significantly improved our children's test scores. And I thank you for that. Here this legislation today is not to improve, where this legislation is not improving starts on line 4.7 and goes to 4.23 or 4.22. We feel this language impedes competition and blocks many contractors in each of our school districts from bidding on local work. You should not implement requirements that eliminate competitive bidding. The construction in industry is short of employees. The school districts want their schools to be opened on time each fall. This current language will increase pressure on those construction schedules, on the workers, because overtime will be needed, and on their families as they will be missing the ball games. I have nephews that are sheet metal union workers. I have nephews that are pipe fitters in the union. And I have a son that's a plumber in the union. I'm here today requesting that union and non-union plumbing, heating, and cooling contractors across the state be allowed to bid these projects. PHCC is willing to work with, us, with the authors of this legislation to improve the children's schools that we are attending. We're asking not to have you approve this today, and we would be willing to work on legis legislative language that improves the opportunities for everyone. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Stand for comments. Thank you. Uh, and then our last testifier is Janie Atchison. Atchison. State your name for the record, proceed your testimony. Welcome to the committee. Um, my name is Janie Atchison. Hello, Chair and committee members. I am a sixth and seventh grade social studies teacher currently on leave from St. Paul Public Schools as a member lobbyist at Education Minnesota. My classroom was built in the 1930s as part of the, as part of the WPA program. This means the temperature is controlled by, excuse me, by a boiler system in the colder months and there is no air conditioning during the warmer months. 
research studies from Harvard, Stanford, the National Bureau of Educa Economic Studies, as well as countless others, have shown what any one of my students already know. As temperatures rise, de learning decreases. In June of 2021, my classroom reached 94 degrees. I have a photo, if anyone would like to see it, I swear it to prove it. Uh, my students were miserable. The night before the district sent, the night before, the district sent a message to parents encouraging them to send their students with a damp cloth and a water bottle to help them cool during the day as if those two items could combat the effects of sweltering heat. Due to safety and liability concerns, my classroom windows only open three inches, they're bolted at that level, and only half of my windows open, which allows for minimal air circulation. I was not provided with a fan from the district. Teachers had to bring in their own fans if they wanted, if they wanted one. Multiple teachers attempted to make swamp coolers in, attempt, in hopes just to cool a portion of their room or bring the temperature back into the 80s. I ask this rhetorically, but how much work would we all get done in this room if we cranked the temp past 90, added high humidity, and had almost no air circulation? My best educated guess is that we would try to get thing, through things as quickly as possible and then leave. My students and I did this for seven hours for multiple days. According to the National Bureau of Economic Statistics, for every one, de for every one degree increase, it is a one per percent decrease in student learning. And if you were trying to test your students on those days, you might as well forget it because all the research shows that students are unable to test well in the heat. But my school, my school district are not alone. The American Council of Civil Engineering gives Minnesota school infrastructure a C minus. From small rural districts to large urban ones, our schools are extremely old. Our students are suffering. It is an equity issue. Students who can pass, sorry, schools and districts who can pass referendums to pay for new buildings do so. And students whose districts are unable to pass these referendums are forced to suffer. I urge this committee to pass this bill so all students in our great state can learn in cool conditions. And I promise you, all seventh graders want is to be cool. <laughs> That's true. Thank you for your testimony. And uh, just before we get to member discussion, I just I hope committee members can try and keep their side conversations, uh, the volume down. It's, it's getting a little out of control, and, and I'd, I'd like to be able to hear the testifiers speak. Uh, so thank you for your testimony. Uh, are there any members of the public wishing to testify to this bill? Seeing none, member discussion to the bill. Representative Doubt. Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative, for bringing this forward. Um, I, I, over the year, you know, Republicans are the original conservationists. Uh, over the years, I've worked on two different bills like this. Um, I actually think there's a better way to do this bill uh, that would allow you to do more work. Um, a few years ago, we had a bill that uh, would, uh, it, was a, it was a financing mechanism that allowed a company to come in and upgrade the HVAC systems. Um, and then uh, you could use the future savings as uh, the payment back to the, to the company and they would guarantee the savings. The amount of, of energy loss by having inefficient equipment is mind boggling when you look at the statistics. I also worked on a bill uh, and, and I understand you wanna start somewhere and the schools is a great place to start, uh, but this is about a half a percent um, of the buildings that are out there, the huge, enormous buildings that have old HVAC equipment that, that should be upgraded if you wanna really make a, a meaningful dent in, uh, in, in uh, energy use in, in the state. Uh, there's another bill that we worked on at one time that would have allowed a tax credit for companies that outdated or that would replace outdated equipment for more energy efficient equipment and uh, that uh, allows them to keep their costs down but also uh, much less energy use which i think we all want to achieve so um if if uh those that are supporting this bill if you want to if you want a bill uh, that will actually do about a hundred times the work that this one does come and see me i'll help you write it uh because i think this is uh, sort of on the right track, but the ideas that, that I have and that we've worked in the past won't take any general fund appropriation. Um, so you can use your money for other stuff and you can still accomplish this times 100. Um, and there are really creative ways to do that that other states are doing. And, and all of the people here that do this great work would be busy for 100 years if we pass that bill. So thank you. 
So, um, Jordan, any closing comments? Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think it's it's really obvious that air that the air in our schools is as important to learn is important for our children's learning. So um, I hope you can support this bill, and I hope uh, to keep working with you, Chair Stevenson, um, and you, Representative Doubt, on making sure that our kids can learn in schools. I'm happy to work with all the advocates as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Representative Jordan. And with that, the bill is laid over. Uh, the next item on our agenda is House File 1189 from Representative Freiburg. Oh. Sorry. You're okay. I, I thought I was, uh, <laughs> thought there was one more. <laughs> okay, we have a lot of people leaving the room, so we'll maybe uh, let it, them do that one. Because it's me? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I think you should take this very personally. <laughs> okay. Whenever you're ready, you move your bill. Yeah, just one moment. Okay. Uh, so, Mr. Chair, thank you for considering this. Were you, uh, actually, I don't believe we discussed the motion. Is the motion to... Uh, to the general register. Okay. I would like to move that House File 1189 be recommended to be re-referred to the general register. Representative Freiburg moves House File 1189 be recommended to be placed in the general register, and that you have a DE1 amendment. Yes. Um, would it be okay just to uh, adopt that? Uh, that would put the bill in the shape I would like. This so is an author's amendment to get the bill in the shape that the author would like to consider it. Uh, so Representative Freiburg moves the DE1 amendment. Discussion to the amendment. Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion prevails. DE1 is adopted. Representative Freiburg, to your bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. House File 1189 corrects a hidden problem for some Minnesota consumers with mandatory auto insurance policies. Some insurance companies have been including statute of limitations periods within their contracts that are shorter uh, than the statute of limitations that are shorter than the period required by our current law. This has caused some to lose out on benefits they have paid for in their auto insurance. There's a split in decisions in the Minnesota and federal courts over these shortened contractual limitations, and House File 1189 will bring clarity to the situation. Um, we've discussed the current law with the Insurance Federation, and we developed the DE amendment, which requires insurance companies to comply with the six-year statute of limitations, um, and that's, that, that is the underlying bill. We've also agreed to lower the limitation period for underinsured motorist claims from the current six years to four years from the date of accrual. Accrual under Minnesota case law is the date you settle with, uh, settle with the at-fault driver and you know that you know is uninsured. We, had an, we added an effective date to make this change prospective starting on August 1st for policies issued and renewed after that date. Um, so that's a brief summary of what the DE amendment does and uh, with that I'd like to turn it over to my testifiers. All right, and we have uh, two people who are signed up to testify. The first is Chuck Slane, Mr. Slane. Unless I saw Mr. Carlson walk up. I don't know if you wanted to go first, Mr. Carlson. I'll go ahead. Mr. Slane. Good afternoon, Chairman and members of the committee. Statutes of limitations are about certainty for both sides of the fight. It's very important that people be able to know what is the time limit for me to be able to choose to just start a lawsuit. The problem in Minnesota law right now is that some insurance companies are changing the rules in the policy of insurance. And not only that, some policies have different sets of rules in different policies from the same company. And then you ask for the policies so that you can determine what the rules are and they ask you why would you want those. What this bill does is simply provide certainty on two things. What's the time limit and when does the clock start ticking? And that benefits both sides of the contract just so we know what the rules to the game are. And so we urge you to pass this bill. Thank you, Mr. Slane. Mr. Carlson. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Joel Carlson, I'm here on behalf of the Minnesota Association for Justice and I think both um, um, Representative Freiberger and Mr. Slane explained it, but since 1999, the statute of limitations accrued for an underinsured motorist claim um, uh, at the date that you settled with the um, uh, at-fault driver. In 2014, a case in the federal court said 
these contractual limitations apply. So in that case, the consumer was still litigating his liability case, and he lost completely his right to bring an underinsured motorist claim after that was settled. This brings clarity to the law, but I want to make a couple points for the record um, so, that we're, so that we're clear. The accrual date as established by the Minnesota courts under the onus decision remains good law in Minnesota. So you have to bring the case uh, within four years from the date you settle with the uh, liability carrier. It also doesn't change the current law in Minnesota regarding providing notice, they call it a Schmidt notice, that has to go to the liability carrier. And we want to make sure we get on the record um, uh, for uh, all of our friends in the insurance industry to make sure we're not disturbing those two very important uh, aspects of Minnesota law. So we're not changing the accrual um, uh, when the clock starts to run, and we're not uh, at all changing the notice that the insurer gets when you settle with the uh, liability carrier, and that's what starts the clock running. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Thank you, Mr. Carlson. Are there any members of the public wishing to testify to this bill? Seeing none, discussion to the bill. Representative Brindley. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have a couple of questions just on the actual language. On line 1.9 of the DE, um, the, it used the term date of accrual. Um, do you mean the language the court used when they said the date of settlement with or judgment against the tortfeasor? That, that's what we... Just want to make sure we've got clarity on what that language means. Sure. And Representative Freiberg, I don't know if you want to direct that to Mr. Slane or Mr. Carlson. Mr. Uh, Carlson. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair uh, and Representative, uh, accrual is the uh, legal definition of when a claim uh, uh, is um, is. Uh, is right. Right. I was looking for the right for the right word. That's when the claim is right. The date of the accident would be an accrual date on the underlying policy itself. The accrual date for an underinsured claim. Uh, when is that ripe? That's when you settle with the negligent party because that's when you know you might be underinsured. So that accrual is the legal term for when you're when the clock starts ticking. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so this is in no way going to impact or interfere with the Schmidt notice requirement? <laughs> Mr. Slane? Ms. Representative, that's correct. Oh. It's uh, very important that uh, that process has been fully litigated and the rules are clear and this uh, bill has uh, no changes to that whatsoever. Representative Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Seeing no further discussion, Representative Freiberg, closing comments. Uh, thank you. This will help bring clarity to the law, and I would encourage members to vote green or support it, <laughs> I guess. Representative recommended. Freiberg renews his motion that House File 1189, as amended, be recommended to be placed on the General Register. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. House File 80, 1189, as amended, is recommended to be placed on the General Register. The, la uh, the next item on our agenda today is House File 1540 from Representative Cagle. Representative Cagle, would you like to move your bill? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd move that House File 1540 be laid over for possible inclusion. Representative Cagle moves House File 1540 be laid over for possible inclusion. Representative Cagle, to your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Um, this, uh, th thank you for allowing me to present House File 1540, which would establish a mental health parity and substance abuse account office within the Department of Commerce. Um, it's been over 25 years since the first federal mental health parity legislation was passed to require adequate and equal coverage for behavioral health care. Both mental health and substance use condition, or er, um, both mental health and substance use conditions, but access to the critical services remains elusive um, for many customers with health, in, with, with health insurance. The federal parity rule requires health plans offer basic um, behavioral health coverage to ensure that to, to ensure that financial requirements such as deductibles, co-payments, co-insurance, and out-of-pocket limits, and treatment limits such as day and visit limits, as well as non-quantitative 
quantitative limits on benefits such as prior authorization of these benefits are no more restrictive than those of surgical or medical benefits. Um, however, according to a national report published in 2019 by Millman, it's clear that despite the efforts to enforce mental health parity, the lack of access to mental health care is getting worse. Uh, the report found that a, chi that a child's mental health office visit was over 10 times more likely to be out of network than a primary care office visit and twice as likely as an adult mental health office visit. Uh, additionally, spending for mental health care has not shifted despite the dire need and sits just at 2.4% of overall health care spending. Um, and so with, the, um, what is clear is that the state and federal lawmakers, insurance regula regulators, and employers must make a concerted effort to ensure mental health parity is a reality and that patients can access the mental health care they need. I believe establishing an oversight office within the Department of Commerce will have a positive impact. And with that, I will um, turn it over to my testifier. Mr. Amberg, you want to state your name for the record, proceed your testimony. Yep. Um, Bill Amberg, Amberg Law Office, representing the Minnesota Psychiatric Society. Um, I'm going to read the testimony of Dr. Michael Trangle, who's the chair of our legislative committee and was out of town and couldn't make it. <clears throat> Minnesota continues to have inadequate insurance networks and poor access to mental health and substance use resources when compared to medical and surgical care access and networks. Enforcement of Minnesota's parity law ranges from absent to very inadequate. House File 1540 amends the department's current parity law by creating and funding a department of parity training and enforcement within the Commerce Department to ensure that enforcement actually occurs. Um, with House File 1540, Commerce and other departments with jurisdiction can set a standard that patients can get initial routine access within 10 business days in addition to the current standard of 30 miles or a 30 minute drive. This is based upon the access standard chosen by the federal government for use in their exchanges, healthcare.gov, to be used starting in 2024. Um, under House File 1540, um, Departments could include uh, measuring routine initial access to behavioral health clinicians, for example, MDs, um, advanced practice uh, nurses in psychiatry, um, PAs with psychiatric training and therapists, and compare this with medical, surgical physicians and allied medical staff. Whenever behavioral access is more than 10% worse, health plans are expected to take corrective action. When it's more than 40% worse, the corrective action needs to be faster and more rigorous. Um, I also want to cl uh, clarify that the health department does also have some jurisdiction and this is uh, the first house hearing ever for this bill. Um, so this is an initial first step, but um, I think there might be a couple of tweaks and changes to come as we move through the process. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Amber. Uh, is there any members of the public wishing to testify to this bill? Seeing none, discussion to the bill. Representative Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Cable. Can you just can you just tell me briefly? I'm just wondering um, what would be different with this. What 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 would be different in the authority that Commerce currently has in overseeing these things? Representative Cable. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative Brindley. I think it's um, it's not so much what would be different; it's that they would actually have the resources. Representative Brindley. Mr. Kelly here. Hmm. Yep, Mr. Wonder, Kelly is here. I wonder if he Question. can. Thank you. Yeah, like what what would be the difference um, right now is the, I, I assume, I mean, this is absorbed in the commerce budget somewhere, right? I mean, these things are being done. There's oversight. So what would what would be the difference? Mr. Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, for the record, John Kelly, Director of Government Affairs for the Department of Commerce. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, uh, Representative Brindley, the difference is that there would, as Representative Cagle mentioned, there would be dedicated funding. In the past, we've had some federal grant funding to really dig into this issue, but right now, and so this money would focus the department's efforts with additional staff instead of it being absorbed by our enforcement division, uh, existing uh, health insurance related enforcement staff, and allow us to focus on this issue and work with our partners at the health department. 
Yeah, I'll just, just add only because uh, this provision was in the omnibus bill coming up uh, commerce two years ago, mm -hmm. and it was also in the reinsurance bill uh, last year, uh, both of which I carried. So this has been something that I've been working on. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's been Representative Cagle's proposal. I think she offered it as an amendment as a bill in prior years. But, uh, you know, the, the understanding that I have is that there's been an adequate level of resources for enforcement to actually ensure that our existing parity laws are enforced. And that's that's what we're seeking to add here is getting that extra level of enforcement with actual resources and people doing that work over what is currently within the insurance division. Representative Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, well, I guess I would, I would ask then what, um, what problems have, have, have arisen that, that leads to this need? I mean, have there, are there complaints that are not being dealt with currently? I, I, what 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 has happened so far that would indicate the need for this? And I don't know if Mr. Amberg wants to come back because he did testify, and, and I know Representative Cagle, you might I'll let you have first crack at this, but there was testimony from most of Mr. Amberg about the deficiencies in our mental health care system, but also Representative Cagle can speak to that. But thank you, Mr. Chair. And so um, you know, it's just that there's lack of access. Um, back in 2014, when I was trying to find my brother um, a, a place for his treatment um, to handle his um, opioid use disorder, we couldn't find anywhere. There was one place that had an opening in all of Minnesota, and so we ended up sending my brother to California. Um, it was great. I'm glad he went there, and it's amazing, and he's doing great, and been sober for eight years now. But um, you know, and I even found it after my own, uh, after my accident, trying to find you know somebody to help me deal with the the trauma that um, through that. And it's you know in the cities it's easier to find that, but I imagine um, you know out when we were up in Bemidji for the Opioid Epidemic Response Advisory Council. There was a huge. They told us the huge need was just the you know they need. Um, detox centers and so um, when there's this huge need and then there's supposed to be parity why is there this big gap and so um, just kind of anecdotally that's really where I've seen it is just through the um, addiction side not seeing a lot of that stuff available out out in our state. Mr. Amberg do you have anything to add to that? Um, yeah just briefly Mr. Chair I also want to direct members to this one pager that's in their packets quite a bit of good data right on this topic from the Millman study um, and I can get you the whole thing if you're looking for it. But one takeaway from the Milliman study is how poorly Minnesota fared compared to other states. So from the perspective of the Minnesota Psychiatric Society, we've been working with commerce and health for many years, and I think it's really a conclusion. They just do not have the resources to adequately um, enforce the Wellstone Ramstead Act. Yeah, I'll give it right back to you, but the only other thing I'd say is I had initially hoped to do, this is one of several proposals trying to get mm -hmm. this thing that we've heard. And we've kind of heard them on a piecemeal basis. I'm sorry about that. I had hoped to do them uh, all together, but you know, Representative Kraft has his network adequacy bill and then there's the mm -hmm. collaborative care bill. And we've been trying to do a lot to get at this particular issue. And this is the last one of the bills. So I think it's maybe better to think of them in totality. And I, that's my fault for not being able to do them all on the same day for various scheduling reasons. Sure. But Representative Newbrinley. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate that because my, my concern would be, I, I think everyone knows and agrees we have a huge access problem. My concern is that, you know, the, the, by, by, with this mental health parity office, we're talking strategies. I, I, I just think at the end of the day, we need bodies. We need people. We don't need, like oversight is not our problem. Oversight overseeing these these facilities and these providers, that's not our problem. We just don't have the providers. Uh, you know, um, Representative Frederick had a had a great bill um, to to actually to actually ideally, I think it'll hope it'll work where there's gonna be a report, but it'll bring more providers online with this with this Mankato facility. Um, that's what we need. We need to invest in bringing providers online. And, and I just have a tough time. I see this kind of thing all the time. I'm just not sure that, you know, the office oversee compliance, stakeholder engagement, review complaints, um, a resource for ensuring health plan compliance. That's great, but the problem is as, as, as you indicated, Representative Cagle, the problem is there's no one to see. <laughs> there's, we just don't have access, and I, and I don't see how this bill is going to actually increase access for us. 
Um, so I, I appreciate your comments. That was really helpful. I'm just really concerned that this, this bill doesn't get us the access that we're looking for. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Weibling. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you for the bill, Representative Cagle, and I, I appreciate this as one piece in this puzzle, as the chair has mentioned, and I just want to add kind of, uh, you know, how does this help? Um, well, I'll tell you, we hear a lot about how private payers pay more than public. This is in part to get the private payers to actually cover the service so that the providers can actually get paid, and, you know, part of having a workforce is having their actually be able to have people make a living in that workforce. It doesn't, again, this is a multifaceted problem, but um, we need to make sure that, you know, it is expensive to go into these fields and we need to make sure that people can make a living in these fields too. That is part of access as well. So this is one piece of that puzzle. I do think it matters to the availability of the service. Absolutely, it doesn't fix the whole thing for sure but making sure that the insurers treat this and that there's parity is a big piece in making sure the services are available. So thank you. Thank you. Closing comments, Representative Cagle. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. Like, um, you know, this is just one piece of the puzzle and I think um, there's never gonna be one bill that fixes every problem. And so, uh, you know, we need to look at this as, a, as more of a holistic picture. And so um, with that, I thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, it's one piece, but it's a really good piece, Representative Kegel. So with that, the bill is laid over. Uh, the last bill on our agenda today is House File 2891 from Representative Torkelson. Representative Torkelson, I will move uh, that House File 2891 be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. I understand you have the DE1 amendment. Uh, Thank you. Which I will move on your behalf if you wanted to briefly describe the DE1. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, the DE1 puts the bill in the shape I would like. DE1 is an author's amendment putting the bill in the shape the author would like. Any discussion to the amendment? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. DE1 is adopted. Representative Torkelson to your bill. Thank you for hearing this bill this afternoon, Mr. Chair. I'm so thrilled that you saved the best for last. I have a testifier that will... Uh, last bill before deadline, Representative Torkelson. Uh, I'm honored. I am truly honored. <laughs> I have a... Mr. K or Mr. Claiborne is here to explain the bill. All right, Mr. Uh, Claiborne. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. For the record, Bruce Claiborne, I represent the Parthenon Agency in this matter, and they're a collection of ag co-ops that have self-insured their truck fleets. And the, what I, we have here today is a hopefully an easy layup for the committee. Uh, the issue we're trying to solve here is which assets to look at in terms of uh, being able to pay the claims for self-insurance. A few years ago, we had a member co-op who had low cash flow but they had many millions of dollars of grain in the bin. And the department had canceled their insurance because they did not have adequate cash flow in three of the last five years, even though they had millions of dollars in the grain. And so we started to discuss this with the department and settled on a definition of working capital versus cash flow. And you'll see the DE is radically different than your bill. We, this was our effort when we put the bill together, just to say you didn't have to use a negative funds flow. And that's the cash portion. Uh, I'll spare you all the details and maybe give you the highlights. Uh, on the DE 1.8, uh, the applicant's net working capital instead of the net funds flow, that's how the department has been doing it for the last 30, 40 years, has been looking at cash flow. We go down to line 1.1314. Uh, they just have to make sure that the co-op has a net positive income or working capital in three of the last five years. And then finally, 1.18 and 1.9. Uh, the commissioner must define that, which is net assets minus less, less liabilities, net liabilities. And so it really just changes ultimately the cash flow conversation to a working capital when they're evaluating self-insurance. And Mr. Kelly here, we do have peace in the valley. Mr. Kelly is here to explain this. If there's any more uh, that you'd like to know about it. Mr. Kelly, uh, did you, you were on my list of uh, testifiers, so I don't know if you wanted to make comments. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, for the record, again, uh, John Kelly, Director of Government Affairs for the Minnesota Department of Commerce. Um, and just want to thank uh, the bill author as well as uh, Mr. Cleveland for working with the department on this one. Um, we think that we've got to a good place. Uh, the, what we, the reason why the bill is amended as it is is because the jurisdiction for the department and the, how this actually works in practice is covered in Minnesota rules. And so there's another distinction uh, here that we are changing with this rulemaking directive and in that, um, you know, the uh, 
the instance where the self-insured auto uh, co-op had to have their authority revoked, there is not flexibility. There is a certain part test in the rules and there is a must instead of a may for the commissioner and they didn't meet the criteria in the three of the five years and so that's what we followed the, the Minnesota rules on this. So what we've done here is one, uh, update the what our examiners look at to align with both the reality for our ag co-ops as well as general accounting principle terms. Uh, when this rule was established in 1987, I think a year later they changed the term of working funds flow, or, uh, sorry, cash funds flow, and so we're updating that. Um, we really think that this update to the rule and under the expedited rulemaking will allow us to uh, make sure that these co-ops can pay claims if they need to pay claims, but also have the flexibility uh, to, for our folks to look at the realities on the ground um, where they have millions of dollars in the bin and uh, the total ability to pay these claims and it gives the commissioners some discretion. So we appreciate uh, the stakeholders working with us on this one. I think it's a good bill as amended. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. And I agree and I'll just say that my recollection, and I could be wrong, I'm looking at Mr. Clevin, I think this was in the jobs conference report last year that didn't get adopted. I, what I recall, the important thing, is I recall that in conference committee discussions, uh, Senator Dames uh, interrogating uh, uh, maybe the department about uh, this bill and really going through it line by line and pushing hard and testing all the assumptions. And uh, he was ultimately satisfied with the bill, as, as I recall. And I mean this as a compliment to Senator Dames. If you can get Senator Dames to a yes, then you're probably uh, in a good place with a bill like this. So um, I, I think it's a good bill. I'm glad it's brought forward. Any discussion uh, to the bill? Representative Cleborn. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Mr. Tor uh, Representative Torkelson. Um, my question is, okay, so if they don't have the working capital, I get that. Is there any risk um, of making sure, we don't want to put the co-op in risk of being, um, of their viability being in risk if there would be a serious accident? Would this in any way jeopardize the operation of the co-op as an ongoing entity? So it's kind of separate from the insurance piece of handling the victim of the claim, but the co-op itself. Representative Torres, I'll give you first crack, but Mr. Kelly looks pretty eager to answer that question. I, <laughs> Feel free to I was over to just him. going to pass it off. Mr. Mr. Kelly. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and Representative. So if you look at the current Minnesota rules that are being amended, it is not just the working capital. We're looking at the entire picture of the viability of the co-op or any not, it's not just a co-op. This is not just applied to co-ops. I want to make that clear. It's all non-political subdivisions. Um, but the idea here is that in the period of time, it's not just one year, it's over a period of time. We're able to look at the entire financial picture. Uh, and as uh, you know, in the definition of working capital, it's, it, you know, we would be able to make that evaluation and still ensure that there's solvency. So we feel confident with these changes that that will still be the case. <clears throat> Seeing no further discussion, Representative Torkelson, closing comments. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Chair, for hearing this bill. The Senator Dames happens to be my senator, uh, but I am not Senator Dames, and I appreciate my testifiers uh, having uh, the information needed to uh, make sure that this bill is in the shape it should be, and I hope that you consider to include it in your omnibus bill. We agree that there is only one, Senator Dames. Uh, and with that, the bill is laid over. Representative O'Driscoll. Well, Mr. Chair, since we are kind of at that point where soon the announcement will be to uh, return our tables to the up and right locked position as we make our final approach to um, our landing, can you give us an idea of what you see um, in the next um, few meetings? And um, are you planning on holding any informational hearings uh, beyond deadline? Oh boy, the second question I haven't thought past uh, Friday really. <laughs> so, <laughs> you're, I, I, you're open I have for no, advice. Let me just say, good. Let me just say that at this moment, I have uh, I have no plans to hold informational hearings, but certainly can't uh, rule that uh, uh, out. I do expect uh, we have a few items that are still left on our agenda. Obviously, our our, our budget bill. Uh, we also have a few of the larger uh, standalone bills. One in particular I can think of that uh, we will, I'm very certain, be hearing and, and taking action on in the in the coming weeks. We did just receive uh, our targets yesterday, uh, so uh, we will be assembling a. I will be assembling a budget proposal to bring before it, uh, this committee for consideration in the very 
near future. Uh, we in the Commerce Committee have a good history of getting our bill out quickly and uh, settling it quickly, and I intend to continue with that practice. Representative Driscoll. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, are you planning on, on any additional meetings between now and the May 4th recess, or excuse me, the April 4th recess? Representative O'Driscoll, I, I, we definitely will meet at our scheduled times uh, next week. Uh, and beyond that, I have no decisions that I can share with you. I would expect at least one additional meeting, whether it is in our regular time or in, uh, in an unscheduled time at this point. And I suspect, Mr. Chair, that you and I will get an opportunity to speak offline as we have in the past. Of course. To kind of get the glide path so that we don't um, have to use um, firefighting foam to put out a particular fire that could arise. As long as it doesn't have PFAS in it. That's where I was going, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Absolutely, I set you up for that. We work well together, as everyone knows. And with that, the meeting is adjourned.